Every day you've got to confess that you are not a slave to sin and Satan. You've got to speak up. And I'll tell you, when you speak up on the basis of what the blood of Jesus has done, there is no devil in hell that will talk back to you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, the Bible says. Amen. Look at um, the message translation, which is usually very modern English. It says, at first everyone was appalled. He didn't even look human. A ruined face, disfigured beyond recognition. <clears throat> what more do you want? Uh, NIV, New International Version. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being. And his form marred beyond human likeness. Amazing. Simply saying that Jesus hanging on the cross, wounded from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, his appearance was so marred, probably his flesh hanging because they beat him with whip that had hooks metal hooks to it. It tore the flesh off of his body. They put a crown of thorns on his head, so blood was flowing from the head. Beat him. They beat the thorn on his head. Wounded everywhere. The whole body covered in blood. Beaten all over until it, the body became like a plowed field, the Bible says. Hands and feet nailed, hanging there. What a different picture than the picture that we see of many statues of Jesus hanging on the cross. Usually it's a very stylish Jesus hanging like this, you know. With one drop of blood on each hand, the palm of his hand, 
and one drop on his, at his feet and one right here at the side, just few drops here and there and just a little bit of sweat. That's a wrong picture. <laughs> you know, when you look at that picture, that, that, that statue looks like you can go there and kind of worship him or something like that. If you really looked at Jesus, you wouldn't even want to lift up your eyes and look at him. That's how he was looking, the Bible says. You wouldn't want to go anywhere near and touch and worship and look at that again. That's the way Jesus was looking, according to the description of Isaiah. <clears throat> All that because of our rebellion. That's what Isaiah is saying. Chapter 1, verse 2 says, the rebellion of the people was such, they looked horrible. They were described like a human body, totally ruined, completely sick from head to toe, with putrefying sores all over the body, not wound up, not anointed with oil. That's the way it's described. And that's the exact description of Jesus. What God did on the cross was, See, this is the, Isaiah 1 is the description of the results of their rebellion. Because of their rebellion, they were like this. Because they rebelled against God, they've become a people like this. They've become a sick people. The evil consequences is showing in their life, is showing in their, the way they lived. They were stinking literally. Because of their rebellion and walking against the will of God, disobeying the commandments of God, because they lived like that, they were like a sick body that you cannot even behold. A body that, that's a stinking body that you wouldn't want to be anywhere near. You, you wouldn't want to even look sick from top of the head to the bottom of the feet. That's the way they are described. And God took that description and applied it to Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Jesus was made like that. Why? Because of our rebellion, our iniquity. So that's the meaning of the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Remember, our life because of sin became so ugly, so stinking, so bad, unbearably bad, head to toe, we were sick with sin and its evil consequences. And Jesus that hung on the cross became like us because he bore our sin and all our evil consequences there on the cross so that we can look good today. So that our life can be good today. So that we can be healthy today from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet so that we can be blessed today in our spirit, in our soul, in our body, so that we can have well-being today, so that we can be blessed today. Just imagine how God looks at us today. Because Jesus became like us, we have become like Jesus. He took what was on us so that he, we can have what was on him. We have got his wonderful nature through the new birth, and we've got a new life that is beautiful. So everybody say with me, on the cross, on the cross. All, our all our iniquities, the punishment for that iniquity, the for and the evil consequences, the evil consequences. were laid upon Jesus. Laid upon he, Jesus. Bore he bore it all. I was sick from head to toe. But Jesus bore it. He bore all the evil consequences that was destroying me, that was eating me up. It was all laid on him so that I can be healed from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. What has happened through the cross of Calvary is the total healing from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, my friend. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. But we thought he was stricken and smitten by God. We esteemed him not. 
but he was wounded for our transgression he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him and by his stripes we are healed what a wonderful good news this is about the forgiveness of sin by his stripes we've been healed sin made us sick sin made us thinking sin made us ugly sin made us completely like that picture we read in isaiah 1 but jesus made us what we are today do you really believe that if you really believe that lift up your hands both hands and say thank you lord jesus everybody say thank you lord jesus thank you lord jesus thank you lord jesus because that is the truth my friend that is how the bible puts it that is how the bible puts it the final picture is in ephesians chapter 1 in ephesians chapter 1 you'll understand more of isaiah 53 6 when you look at ephesians 1 verse 7 ephesians 1 7 says in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace now paul looks at the same cross the blood of jesus that was shed and the work that was done on the cross of calvary the same thing that isaiah looks at and now he uses another word for it he says in him we have redemption he uses this word very interesting word because in the old testament times the word redemption was a very important word to the people the jewish people you know in their human relationships many times they themselves had to function as a redeemer suppose i had a close relative who had to go as a slave because he couldn't pay back the debt that he owed somebody in those days if you couldn't pay what you owed you go as a slave and slave yourself for one or two years sometimes you're caught forever because no matter how much you work it didn't pay for your debt so when a person is caught like that unable to get himself out of the slavery the kinsman the nearest relative called kinsman must become a redeemer he is a kinsman redeemer he is called among the jewish people he has got to go and say hey that's my relative i don't want him to be slave forever i will redeem him i'll pay the money i'm going to save him from that and he will pay the money he'll get him out of trouble if a relative, close relative's uh, husband died and she doesn't have children see in those days god gave them all in the promised land he divided the land gave them all land right so every family had land so when a man died and left a wife without children who will the land go to god wanted the land to go perpetually to the from generation to generation to them so they were asked to make this arrangement that one of the brothers of the dead man or a nearest relative in case there he had no brothers or something nearest relative must marry that woman and give her a child so that and and the properties must be brought and given to that child because it's his father's property what god gave that child's father it must continue the inheritance must continue these kinds of arrangements were made i'm sure you're familiar with that and we talked about the kinsman redeemer one christmas just a couple of christmas ago how ruth and uh, her mother-in-law and uh, uh, they came back from uh, moab back to their city after their husbands died and there ruth found a kinsman redeemer who was willing to marry her and give her a new life you know a very interesting story about the kinsman redeemer this was a practice among the jewish people so redeemer is not a new word but the redeemer did also another thing which a lot of people may not be familiar with and that is the redeemer is expected to be an avenger also of blood suppose somebody killed this man's relative according to the jewish custom what they did was the nearest relative had the responsibility to avenge the blood that means go after the guy who killed and kill him <laughs> and avenge the blood it's not for now don't do that you know. 
That's the kind of thing they had. Redeemer is not an ordinary thing. It's a terrific responsibility. It's, a, it's, a, it's a something, it's an obligation that you have to do certain things. They lived in a community and, and they were responsible for these things. You know, Jesus became our kinsman redeemer. To become a kinsman redeemer, you've got to be the closest relative. You can say, well, Jesus is the son of God. In what way is he close a relative of mine? He came taking on human flesh, was born in this world of a woman just like you and I. The son of God became one of us. He became a kinsman to us. He became like us in order to redeem us. Then he had the obligation to redeem us. We were slaves of sin and Satan. And he was now under obligation to redeem us. He had to pay the price that we could not pay. We were slaves of sin and Satan. He paid the price through his own blood, through his own life, redeemed us back to God, set us free. He did all that as a kinsman. But you know, the other thing that a lot of people don't know also he did, the avenger of blood. Don't forget the devil who destroyed the human race, who landed us all in trouble. The devil was the reason behind all of that. On the cross, the Bible says, Jesus triumphed over the devil also, made a public show of his defeat, defeated the devil, went after him for what he did for the human race, and defeated him totally, and made a public show of it, and triumphed over the devil and all of hell for us as the avenger of blood, as our kinsman. Jesus was a perfect kinsman. And Paul has that in the back of his mind. He's thinking about all these things. He says, in him we have redemption. Redemption. When he's thinking of redemption, he's thinking about the Redeemer and his responsibilities and his obligation as a Redeemer. Jesus has become a man, our kinsman. One among our family, the human family. Therefore, he is under, under obligation to redeem us. And he redeemed us from sin and Satan. And defeated the devil because he is a kinsman redeemer who is an avenger of blood also. Went after the devil and defeated him completely for us. And gave us power and authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions. Gave us total authority over the devil. What a wonderful picture he's got in mind when he talks about this. He says, in him we have, a re we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. Now, slavery is a terrible thing. To be a slave of sin and Satan, you need to understand this, you know. See, back in those days, you can go to a slave market and buy a person, a man or a woman, you can buy. Suppose someone went and bought two women as slaves, Anything could happen to these two women because they have no choice. They'll become whatever the one who owns them wants them to become. So one may go and become a cook in someone's house. The other may go and become a prostitute somewhere. Because the guy who buys can use them any which way want. They, uh, he wants. They have no choice. They have no power. They have no say concerning the matter. You know. Just imagine the one who's a cook looking down upon the one who's a prostitute and saying, look at that, that's a bad girl, you know. Why is she a prostitute? I'm just a cook here. She's a prostitute. Well, what can she do? She's powerless. The one who bought her and owns her has taken her by the neck and made her the prostitute. She has no power to deliver herself. This is a wonderful picture of, see, when we understand this, you will understand people and deal with them more compassionately as people sin and plunge into sin and get caught in slavery to sin and Satan in so many ways. When you meet people like that, you can never look down upon them because we were also slave to sin and Satan. Just like one becomes a cook, another becomes prostitute, some of us have been fortunate enough to be not pushed into that. So today we realize that we are all the same. We were all slaves. Slavery is what made us like that. Some of us were into terrible things. There, but we don't look down upon one another. We have no reason to look down upon one another. We have no reason to consider another person worse than us. We were all in sin and slavery to sin and slavery to Satan. 
And Jesus came down to the slave market one day, and for some reason, like one songwriter says, I don't know why Jesus loved me. I love that song. I don't know why he cared. I don't know why he sacrificed his life for me. That's the way the song goes. Oh, but I'm glad. I'm glad he did. That's exactly, you have no, the whole Bible, you find no reason why God loved us and saved us. It is certainly not because you were so good. Not because you were so good looking or because you've been so nice and decent and so on. Not because you've been better than the thousand other people that are around you. Never. There is no reason. That is what grace. Grace needs no reason. For no reason at all. He came into the slave market. Looked at us. Sold in slavery. Traded as slaves. And he said, I'm going to buy this person. I'm going to pay the price, total price. Nobody can beat me on it. I will pay the highest price. Take this person. Take this person to be what? To be another slave? No. To be set free forever. To be set free to live for God. Totally free. That is exactly what has happened. That is what the cross has done to us. It is redemption. Which is the forgiveness of sins through his blood. The forgiveness of sins is the redemption. It is sins that made a slavery, a slave to sin and Satan. Like a person's debt makes him a slave to a creditor. It is sin that made a slave to sin and Satan. And once that sin problem is taken, is taken care of, the devil had no power over us. And today I tell you, because the price of the blood of Jesus has been paid, the price of the blood of Jesus has been paid. The debt has been paid. The devil cannot hold us under his power and sway. And you and I can say no to sin and no to Satan. Don't forget that. You need to look at the devil and tell him every day, you are not my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. I am a blood-marked person. God has marked me. Just like the Israelites house was mar marked with blood so that the angel of death could not enter. Devil, you cannot come in. You cannot touch me. You have no right, no authority over me. I am freed, legally freed, set free. And I live and I serve Jesus and Jesus only. Amen? Every day you got to confess it, who your Lord is. Every day you've got to confess that you are not a slave to sin and Satan. You got to speak up. And I'll tell you, when you speak up on the basis of what the blood of Jesus has done, there is no devil in hell that will talk back to you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, the Bible says. Amen? Joyful, joyful, we adore you, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before you, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of eternal gladness, fill us with the light of day. You are the one. of the joy of living, ocean depths of happiness. You are the one.
this out. Jesus, you're my rescue. Jesus, you are my rescue. Jesus, you are my rescue. I give you everything I am. Jesus, Jesus, you are my rescue. Jesus, you are my rescue. I give you everything. Oh, give him everything. of the joy of living, ocean depths of happy land. You are the one. 